You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 208. This week, a big thank you goes out to Nicholas and Charlotte for their support for the podcast on Patreon and for the wonderful message that they sent me as well. On Patreon, they now get access to special members-only episodes as well as ad-free versions of all of the normal episodes. That's patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar where you can find out more information. Also, I'd like to remind everybody that we are going to have a question and answer episode for episode 231, which seems a long way in the future, uh, about six months or so, but uh, it's really helpful for me if you get in your questions early so I have more time to research and prepare. So throw me questions through Twitter at twitter.com slash historygreatwar or facebook.com slash historyofthegreatwar or historyofthegreatwar at outlook.com for email. Any question is up for grabs, anything with the First World War or before or even after at this point, I guess. Uh, So hit me up and I'll get your questions into that episode and hopefully have some really good answers for you. This is our second episode covering the Polish-Soviet War, and this week we will be discussing the first phase of the fighting between the two armies in Eastern Europe. The Polish-Soviet War as a whole would happen in several distinct phases. The first phase would involve a Polish attack in the border regions between the two areas controlled by the two new nations. This attack would come at a time when the Red Army was not actually ready to actively resist the attacks in any meaningful way. This very first phase of fighting will be our topic for this episode. It would begin in roughly February 1919, and it would begin very small, with just 50 Polish soldiers attacking a small Red Army detachment in the village of Bereza Katuska. If that village does not ring a bell, do not worry. It is just a small town in modern-day western Belarus. After the fighting began in February 1919, it would continue for most of 1919 as the Polish army continued to advance and the Red Army tried to find a way to slow that advance, with the very limited resources it had available to do so. We start today with the Polish advance towards their first major objective, the city of Vilno, which is modern-day Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. Of all of the various fighting during the war, the opening campaign in which the Polish forces advanced towards and then captured Vilno was the most driven by Pilsudski, and it would be the action during which he was the most directly involved, partially for personal reasons. Pilsudski was a native of Vilno, and he quickly made up his mind to at least attempt to capture it as soon as he came to power in late 1918. This decision was prompted by the creation of a Soviet Socialist Republic of Lithuania Belarus in February 1919. This government was very similar to many of the other Soviet governments created in Eastern Europe in the years after the war. It was created by local communist leaders, in this case it was led by Polish communist Joseph Unslicht, but it was fully supported by the leaders in Russia, and everybody knew that. 
The capture of Vilno, while a bit of a passion project for Pilsudski, was part of a larger plan for Pilsudski and his goals for the future of Eastern Europe. Key to this plan was an expansion of Polish influence to the east, although he realized that it may not be possible for Poland to itself control all of the territory. He did believe that Vilno should fall under Polish control, due to the fact that it had a large portion of, of its populations which were Poles. It was historically the capital of Lithuania, which is why it was so important to Lithuanian nationalists, but in the years since it had been part of Russia, other groups had moved into the city in large numbers, and in 1919 Lithuanians within the city were actually outnumbered by other groups like Poles and Russians. Pilsudski wanted to protect, project Polish power far beyond Vilno, with the goal of not necessarily extending Polish borders, but just making sure that the, that the territory would not be incorporated into Russia. The creation of border states like Lithuania and Ukraine would be sufficient, as they would be natural allies for Poland against possible Russian aggression. While this was the long-term goal, in the short term the first step was to capture Vilno and expel the Red Army forces in the area. To achieve this goal, Pilsudski would move behind the front in April, on April 15th. He would bring two infantry divisions and a cavalry brigade with him. These units may not seem like much in terms of manpower, but on the Polish-Soviet front at this point, two infantry divisions possessed a huge amount of striking power relative to the rest of the front. When the fighting started, the front ran from Niemen to Pinsk, a, a distance of about 350 kilometers. And along this front, both sides could field maybe an average of a man every 50 yards. Most of the front was simply being patrolled occasionally, and was not actively manned by troops like would have happened during the First World War. This meant that being able to concentrate two divisions and some cavalry was a huge advantage. The plan was to use it by advancing between Vilno and Lida, which were about 100 kilometers apart. Then once the Polish forces were through the gap between the Soviet concentrations in those two areas, they would turn north towards Vilno and attack it from the south. The advance towards the city involved a cavalry group led by Colonel Belina Prasmowski. He led the way and was followed by infantry. The cavalry advanced much faster than the infantry, and after just a few days the cavalry was able to make it to a set of woods outside the city. Now the next morning, the colonel had two choices. He could take the cautious approach and wait for the infantry, using the time to just watch the city and the areas around it, or he could also take the aggressive approach and just attack straight into it. Bellina would choose to attack, due to his belief that the citizens within the city would support the Poles along with the knowledge that the defenders were not prepared to resist a Polish attack. On the 19th, they charged into the suburbs of the city and headed directly for the rail station. They were able to capture the station and some trains that they were then able to send down to the rails to meet the advancing Polish infantry. The cavalry would spend the rest of the day moving around the city with the Soviet forces mostly just retreating in front of them to the northern side of Vilno. While the first move had been made by the Polish cavalry, they were unable to completely capture the city. After the Polish infantry arrived, they would be able to continue the attack, and only after several days of street fighting were they able to capture it. On the 21st, Pilsudski would arrive in Vilno to officially announce its capture and to stage a victory parade. While the celebrations were still ongoing, news would reach Lenin and the other leaders in Russia about the city's fall. They were shocked by the development and immediately ordered local troops to recapture the city. The order would come down from Lenin that, quote, The loss of Vilna has strengthened the Entente still further. It is essential to ensure the maximum speed for the recovery of the city in the shortest possible time. Hasten the movement of reinforcements already on the way and act more energetically. Inside the city, the Polish army began to arrest anybody who was connected with the Soviet government that had been created. Some of the leaders were arrested and then executed at the earliest possible opportunity. The Vilno campaign was one of the most successful operations by the Polish army during the fighting after the war. Its success had been greatly assisted by the inability of the communists to make common cause with the Lithuanian population, who rejected the Soviet government that had been put in place in Lithuania in 1919. With the fall of Vilno, fighting between the Polish army and the Red Army continued. The next target for the Polish advance was 180 kilometers to the southeast, Minsk. 
Minsk, even more than Vilno, was an important junction for railways, specifically those that ran north to south through Russia. The Polish forces would be led by General Sivitsky, who commanded 12,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry. The attack would involve what I would probably call the ideal set of circumstances for offensive operations in the theater during the early fighting. The garrison in the city was isolated from other forces. The attackers had large numbers of cavalry that were highly mobile, and this allowed them to advance the cavalry around the city to cut off the railways to the rear, with the inf and the infantry could do most of the fighting near the city. After this plan was successful, the city was destined to fall. It was just a matter of time. The fighting would continue for over a week, with it not ending until August 8th. The fall of Minsk was more important than the fall of Vilno. For one thing, it was a more important transportation nexus. But also importantly, it proved that the Russian method of defending the border regions, with widely dispersed garrisons in the cities, was not going to work against a concerted attack by the Polish army. The ability of the offensive units to concentrate, surround, and then defeat any of the garrisons left by the Red Army meant that the Russian defensive system had to be altered in some way, but any change would require more resources, and those were resources that the Russians simply did not have. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean Spiced Tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. After the fall of Vilno and Minsk, the fighting in the borderlands between the Poles and the Russians would slow, due to all the various problems and commitments that the two armies were forced to deal with. For the Soviets, the second half of 1919 would see white resistance reach the peak of its capabilities and power. In the north, Yudinich would march towards Petrograd, and in the south, Denikin would launch his assault towards Moscow. This may have been a huge problem for the Russians if the Polish army was not also preoccupied with a different theater. In the south, the Polish army was engaging the Ukrainians in western Ukraine around the city of Lvov. The campaign to capture this city would consume most of the available Polish forces during the summer months. Once it was in Polish hands, Pilsudski and the other Polish leaders began to reconsider the state of the war. With Vilno, Minsk, and the parts of Ukraine in Polish hands, and the growing Polish army in danger of being overstretched, the Polish leaders began discussing the possibility of signing a ceasefire with the Soviets. The purpose of this ceasefire was not entirely related to the situation in the Polish army. 
Pilsudski was also concerned about the situation with the Whites, which at the time were appearing to do quite well. The Polish leaders were never on friendly relations with the white leaders. Uh, Kolchak had always rejected the very concept of an independent Poland, a viewpoint in line with his views on all the other nationalities of the old empire. Dinikin had for some time been far more conciliatory with the Polish leaders. However, as his strength and success grew, he began to move further towards Kolchak's views on the matter. This was a critical point. Pilsudski believed that whoever won the Russian Civil War, they would make Poland their next target, which was probably entirely accurate. Therefore, he was in a position where he could perhaps choose who he wanted the Polish army to face in that situation. He could choose to deal with Lenin and the communists, and so he began secret ceasefire negotiations with the Soviets in late 1919. Lenin and the Soviet leaders were more than happy to entertain ceasefire discussions. The threats from the Whites were growing, and if peace could be signed in the West, even briefly, it would free upwards of 40,000 troops that were desperately needed to meet the White advances. I know I harped on this a lot in previous episodes, but the stated policies of the Whites in relations to the new countries like Poland were incredibly counterproductive, and this is the perfect example as to why. On November 14th, the communist leaders accepted the terms presented to it by Pilsudski. The agreement stated that the new border would mostly be at the point where the fighting had ended, and there would also be a 10-kilometer wide neutral zone between the two armies. The communists would also have to end any attempts at agitation within the Polish army or within Poland itself, but both sides viewed this treaty as strictly temporary, just a brief respite from the fighting. Both believed that the fighting would continue at some later date, and the period where the treaty was in force would provide them with the ability to build up their forces and to get their internal affairs in order. Even just a few weeks after the treaty was signed, with the white threat drastically receding, Russian troops began to move back onto the new border with Poland. On both sides, staff officers were already poring over maps and creating plans for attacks, attacks that would make 1920 a very busy year. During the early months of 1920, both sides would be preparing for war, and both sides also knew that the other side was preparing for war, which just caused them to be more concerned about their army, which caused them to ramp up their preparations to even greater levels. On the Polish side, they had their own reasons to attack. There were concerns about the continued fighting in the Baltics, uh, with the national armies in those states still fighting with the Reds and Whites and the Germans. Pilsudski also still firmly believed that at some point the Red Army would attack into Poland, and so he thought the best course of action was actually to preempt that attack with one of his own. On the communist side, as soon as peace discussions had begun in late 1919, there had been several viewpoints among the communist leaders. During this period, they all still believed that they were the beginnings of an international revolution, one that they would help to spread both militarily and ideologically. There were different paths that could be taken by the Russian communists in the early 1920s that would accomplish this goal. There was one set of paths that led directly through Poland and into Western Europe, and others that would go other directions. The question on the Western path was one of timing. There were those who believed that the Red Army should attack as soon as possible, regardless of the situation in Russia at the time. This course often found its strongest support for the, from those who had lived in Western Europe before the revolution, and who believed that the isolation of Soviet Russia, which in late 1919 seemed almost complete, was an untenable situation. The only option to prevent this isolation and to continue the growth of the worldwide revolution was to attack immediately. From a military perspective, there was some logic to this view. If Poland could be conquered, beyond it lay a disarmed Germany and an exhausted Western Europe. There were other leaders who believed that the Russian communists should wait until they had gained full control of Russia before they started, started fighting any foreign armies. This group was often made up of those who had always lived in Russia and who had a very Russia-centric view. They believed that it was madness, with the continued disorder and turmoil throughout Russia, to engage in a military conflict with foreign powers. Instead, all of that strength that the communists would have spent attacking Poland should be spent on bringing all of Russia under their control, and then, in the future, they could begin their military campaign against the West. 
There were also those who did not believe that the Russians should attack west at all, and instead it would be more profitable to focus on the east, and to take down the western capitalists by first removing their colonial possessions in Asia from them. Some time was spent trying to make this eastern approach a reality, mostly from a political standpoint, like with the Congress of Peoples of the East, but very little progress would be made in making the eastern path a reality, and so all eyes were turned westward. During late 1919 and early 1920, while Poland was frantically building up its army, it was able to utilize its relations with western countries to its advantage. Nobody was going to provide them with large numbers of troops, but both the French and the United States gave them money with which they could buy large quantities of allied weapons and ammunition that the western countries were trying to sell as they demobilized. These loans accelerated the expansion of the Polish army, but they came with a clear message from the western countries. They fully supported the Polish army being used for defensive purposes, but not for attacking. Now, they did not officially forbid the Poles from these attacks, which they knew they might be able to do anyway, even if the Allies told them not to. But they also made it clear that they would not support it. This was more interesting when you look at what the Soviets believed. They were saying in their propaganda that the Poles were not an aggressive people. In fact, they did not even want to fight. Instead, they were just reluctant pawns in the machinations of the Western imperialists, who wanted to use them as weapons against the World Revolution. These were the same types of accusations that were leveled against the Whites, that they were pawns in a game played by the Western powers. In the case of the Poles, it was even less true. The Poles were doing whatever they wanted to do, and they didn't really care what anybody else thought. The Polish leaders needed little encouragement to attack, but they had to solve some of the problems that the Polish army was experiencing before they could think about advancing into Russian territory. The first problem was simply transporting all of the goods that they had purchased in Western Europe back to Poland. Then once it was there, units had to be re-equipped with the new equipment and prepared for further fighting. This all often involved almost completely reorganizing all of the units, since they were greatly expanding and because the fighting during 1919 had often been done by units that were thrown together for specific tasks with very little coherent structure. This type of spontaneous organization would not be sufficient when it came to further fighting against a reinforced Red Army. The Russians were also trying to execute a similar reorganization. Now, they could not import large numbers of supplies from external states, but they had large numbers of resources that could be repositioned internally. A critical point was in the opening weeks and months of 1920, at which point the Western Front, as the Red Army called it, gained the highest reinforcement priority. This meant that large numbers of troops and large quantities of supplies were rerouted from other theaters and sent west. This involved almost 200,000 men, with the intent to eventually launch them into an attack in the summer of 1920. Just shifting the focus among the Red Army completely changed the situation on the front. During 1919, the Western Front had received the lowest priority in men and supplies. In 1920, if the Poles did attack, they would find a Red Army that was far different than what they had faced in 1919. While the Red Army was preparing for the resumption of fighting, they were also trying to execute political campaigns to weaken the ability of the Polish army to resist them. Now, the goal of these political moves was to weaken the support for the Polish government among the Polish people, and there were two parts to the campaign. The first was propaganda-based, and the second was based around bolstering the communist groups within Poland. From a propaganda perspective, there were messages sent to the Polish troops and civilians that were supposedly from Polish prisoners of war that were still in Russia. They would say things like, quote, Comrades, colleagues, we, Polish prisoners of the Bolsheviks, send you fraternal greetings. We wish to describe for you, without any exaggeration, what the Soviet system means. Soviet Russia is a hundredfold a better fatherland for us than Poland. Under the Tsarist regime, the Russian worker was a slave. In Poland, the hungry worker was often driven to crime. But here, everyone works. The workers administer the whole state through their councils to which delegates are sent from every factory and farm. The workers here have their own schools, their universities, newspapers, and palaces of labor. The Soviet regime guarantees real freedom. Comrades, turn your arms on your oppressors. End quote. At the same time that they were trying to reach out to the Polish soldiers, communist groups launched a wave of strikes across the country. The socialist press also began a campaign to push for peace. 
The problem for the Russians and the Polish socialists is that these actions had precisely the opposite effect that they hoped. Instead of bringing the Polish leaders closer to peace, it actually pushed them further away. Instead of listening to the socialist press and working with the striking workers, the Polish leaders led by Pilsudski and the leaders of the National Democratic Party cracked down on the strikers and closed down the newspapers. In the few cases where units of the Polish army formed soldiers' councils on the Soviet model, they were broken up. Much like in other attempts to undermine local governments, in this Russian attempt, it was just too transparent that it was the Russian Soviets doing it. And nationalist groups within the country had, could put the blame on foreign intervention instead of believing that the feelings were actually genuine feelings from their own people, which in many cases they actually were. These Russian actions also made it clear that the fighting was not over, and Pilsudski and the other leaders of the Polish army were concerned that if they allowed the Red Army to strike first and to take the initiative, they would not be able to regain it or even to respond appropriately. This caused them to plan to launch their attack in early 1920. The target date was always for the spring, and after the worst of the winter weather had passed, which pushed it until sometime in April. On December 22, 1919, an order was sent out to bring the army to its maximum state of readiness by April 1920, not merely to resist Bolshevik attacks, but to permit a definitive settlement of the Russian question. The goal was that attacking as early as possible would allow the Poles to interrupt any Russian efforts to fully mobilize and prepare their own forces. The early date would necessitate attack startings in the south, where the winter would end earlier than in the north. On April 17th, orders were issued for the army to take up their forward positions, with the attack to begin shortly thereafter. The war was about to begin. Again. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we continue our story of the Polish-Soviet War. And remember to send me in those questions for a Q&A episode later this year. History of the Great War at Outlook.com. Thank you. <laughs>